Let's bring in our guest to help us have this conversation this morning. We'll be speaking with uh, Tina Alai. She's a transitional justice lawyer. Good morning, Tina. Good morning, Eric. And uh, we'll also we'll be speaking with Jacqueline Wutere. She is a victim of the post-election violence in 2007. Jackie, good morning. Good morning, Eric. And let's begin that conversation from the point of, you know, the effects of uh, post-election violence and what, what, what happened and what you went through. Jackie, just start with you. Just tell us your story. Um, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, City. Good morning, Ndu. Ndu. Um, what happened was just um, immediately after the, the announcement of the, of, the, of the president, the presidential election, uh, during 2007-2008, I think that where I was living, I, did, I don't really want to say where I was, but where I was living, the violence broke out, and it was um, adjacent to an informal settlement. And so one of the, well, there's a, a gentleman who came to my, uh, my gate, my door. We lived, where, where we lived, we were only two in the compound, and um, this gentleman made out that he was actually coming to look for his, um, his, his neighbor, and that, um, and that uh, policemen were running after him and taking, uh, uh, chasing him. And so I opened the door uh, for him because he was really in a panic, and when he came in, of course, uh, immediately he, locked the, he closed the gate behind him, and I realized that he had very evil intentions. Uh, soon enough, of course, uh, he violated, we got into a fight, and then he raped me, and then finally he left uh, around in the, in the middle of the night. And so uh, that was about two in the morning. Uh, the following day, I didn't go, I didn't go anywhere, I didn't go to hospital also, because the situation was such that curfew and nurses uh, also had to close very early. And it was just about a year, uh, a month later, I realized that I was um, expecting. Um, to cut a long story short, I uh, attempted to have an abortion three times, but it was just not possible, and eventually ended up having that baby who is now 12 years old. Yeah. Um, further to that, I initiated, because of the trauma-related, I met uh, during the counseling sessions, I, I met very many girls who had been violated, some from Mazare, some from, some from Kibra, others in Kawangware, many of the informal settlements in Nairobi. And uh, that pushed me to initiate a, a, a community-based organization called Grace Agenda. We would be able to respond to some of the issues that affected us directly. And the main issue was about how we were going, who, who, who was going to serve as justice um, for, for the violation and for the children born and what was going on. And so we perceived that perhaps the TGRC was going to be an option for us to, to get justice, to seek justice. And we thought that the National Accord was actually a, a way, an entry point uh, of, um, of getting justice. But um, that was not to be. And um, apparently I participated in the TGRC process. Uh, I was a team leader in one of the areas in Nairobi and I got very many, very many women were violated, very, very, very many women. And very many women got children from the violations. And so we thought, what is, what is the best way uh, to go about getting justice? So what used to happen was, um, usually people would invite us to meetings and uh, we'd share our stories and um, we'd actually end up as specimens because uh, people just really wanted to identify that really uh, rape had, uh, had occurred and this is a, a specimen from, from, the, from the violation. Yeah. And uh, uh, we'd be given, uh, many of the girls would, and the women would be given uh, tokens to go home with but we thought that was not very holistic and that was not the best way to go about it. We wanted some holistic care because many women also had uh, medical conditions from it. We had women with disabilities. We had women with suffering different mental health issues. And so we thought that this needed to be um, uh, approached more holistically. So that's when actually I initiated this agenda so that we would have a collective voice to be able to um, speak collectively and uh, to, to have a joint effort would be more, would be more presentable uh, when speaking to people. And so that is how we started uh, talking about uh, uh, sexual violations, mm. um, conflict-related sexual violence from the 2007-2008. And from that time, we have been seeking justice to date. Mm. We did perceive that there was a, a hope when uh, the president in his 2015 State of the Nation address uh, released a 10 billion uh, fund shillings for uh, restorative justice. And we thought that perhaps that is one of the ways in which many of the women who had been violated would get would uh, be either compensated, because justice means different things to different people. What it means to me is not what it means to somebody else. Those who have children might want um, uh, support for their children. Those with medical conditions might want the NHIF card. And there were different ways in which women thought that it would be easy to, to, uh, to be compensated. The TJRC report actually had an annex in which there was, um, in, in which there was a, a a table in which <coughs> uh, 
some form of compensation or justice um, could be followed uh, during that time. And so that was one of the ways in which we also started advocacy because it was not something that was done on our own, mm-hmm. but it was a collective and joint effort um, by uh, officers of, the, of this nation that collected information from all over the country about the different violations in the country and how the women and the, the, those that had been violated sought to, to, be, to, be given, to, to, be, to be to be given justice or for, uh, for them to access justice. Jackie, if I may jump in here and ask you, so at this point, yes. now we're talking about yes. Jackie and the justice then we're looking for, because across the board, yes. across the country, there are thousands of stories of people who may have gone through something similar, um, but then yes. under different circumstances. Mm-hmm. What kind of justice are you looking at? And we're jumping off the premise that the 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 rape that you went through calling it as exactly as it is the rape that you went through would not have happened if the violence that was going on in the area because of the result of the election would not have happened right so right. what justice would you as Jackie be looking for arrest of the individual who did this investigations into who he is and where he is or then care for your child, what then would you be looking for specifically? First of all, uh, straight up, it would be, first of all, care for my child Mm. and uh, acknowledgement. First of all, acknowledge that I was violated. First, acknowledge that there were violations. Um, The violations were recorded in uh, in the CPEV and very many subsequent reports. Uh, but care for my child would be paramount for me and um, uh, and for for my health. That 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 would be the first thing for me. As for access to justice and getting the the, the perpetrator, that is a second a secondary issue to me because I would have to go through a whole social issue of uh, managing my child, managing my family, managing my children, and how they would be able to manage um, uh, that justice. And um, ideally, we we have gone through it as a family and wondered what would the justice be for would justice be. For me to have peace of mind would, uh, in, in, in seeking the perpetrator, would it be for me to have peace of mind? Would it be for me to, would it, would it be for an, uh, an, an, uh, a civil society organization to justify their existence? Or would it be for me to have, or would it be for my child to have closure? Hmm. And so those discussions are very pertinent um, in our family and we have decided that the best way would, uh, for, for me, Jackie, it would be for the children, for, the, for my child, support for my child and, um, and, and, and my health. Um, allow me just to speak for some of the women who are unable to speak and uh, for those who never finished school, didn't complete school, education would be uh, something that is paramount to them. For women with disabilities, it would be ongoing support for them. And um, these things are very possible through the different infrastructures that are within the county governments, the national governments, and between the, the, and, and from the 10 billion fund that's available from the presidential announcement. Do we in Kenya have, uh, before I even say what I'm going to say, thank you for making this story public and for coming to talk to us about it. This isn't easy, uh, but let me ask the question. Do we have a system in this country that actually handles cases such as the one that you are describing so that people who go through this horrific and harrowing experience can actually find a place of solace? There is no system, and that is what um, I think the TGRC was attempting to do and had actually um, uh, 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 had actually explained it very clearly uh, within uh, with, within its report and what they intended to do, but we do we do not have that, and so that is something that has been developed. It has been um, it has been developed in the Kenya National Commission for Human Rights. It's been in partnership with the AG's chambers and other civil society organisations with experts in uh, transitional justice. And Tina will speak to that about uh, will, will speak um, about that a bit more. But um, that process has been very difficult for us, especially for those for sexual violence, which is usually and not acknowledged and not brought to the forefront. And so we thought that perhaps when the DCI said that she was actually pursuing this and um, uh, pursuing the old cases, we thought that it would be very ideal for us to actually speak about what we never got the opportunity to speak about to the police and share that this experience happened to us and that we do need the compensation. While some people, and the DCI specifically mentioned uh, gang rape, and for gang rape, who will you find? Who will you look for in a gang rape situation where there was just generally systemic unruliness from everywhere, from both state officers who are police and from the, the, the hood, hoodlums and hooligans and for supporters of both the, the, the contending parties? Who will you find? But now if you do acknowledge that there was sexual violence, that there was violence, mm-hmm. then there is need and there is justification to compensate and support w- uh, women who are violated. Mm-hmm. Before we take a break, I want to bring you here, uh, Tina Alai. Tina is a transitional justice lawyer, 
And Tina, you've seen the you know attempts at all times and all you know, all these years at you know bringing justice. The attempts by the victims to mm. get justice for them. And now there's a fresh attempt here by the government. What do you make of what we are seeing now from the DCI? Thanks, Eric. Um, City and do. It's a pleasure to be on the show this morning to discuss this issue. Um, and also grateful to Jackie, who has shared her story and continues to champion the cause for many victims and survivors such as herself. Um, when I learned of this development, for me, what immediately came to mind was that what we are seeing just from where you began is that we are far from having closure insofar as the 2007 to 2008 post-election violence is concerned. Um, and this closure is not just for the affected victims, um, but for us all as a society. Um, the victims and survivors who suffered are yet to have closure, and we as a society are yet to have closure. Uh, but the second thing that came to my mind is that true to what we have been agitating for, we have been stating a civil society, and, and when we speak about civil society, um, it includes these victims and communities who suffered, um, is that when we do not meaningfully address past violations, when we do not meaningfully address historical injustices, um, including the harms that are suffered by victims, as well as the underlying causes, you know, those factors that trigger the violence or exacerbate the violence, then what we do is we leave room to breed impunity. Um, and when we say impunity, for example, if the assertion that the DCI um, uh, provided you know, in its statements that victims have come forward to claim that they are being threatened, um, if we use that as a basis, then what we are seeing is we have past perpetrators feeling emboldened enough yep. to threaten to commit the same violations yet again. Why would we be having that? Because we failed as a society altogether to treat those crimes and violations in a way that states to us as a society that those that conduct was unacceptable. And so failure to have closure is continuing to breed impunity, is emboldening perpetrators. And in fact, we fear, as we saw in 2017, that there could be a potential recurrence, not just 2022, but even moving to the future yeah. if we do not address these violations. And secondly, um, finally on this, uh, my preliminary impression, is that when we do not have closure, for past violations and historical injustices. We're creating a ripe ground for persisting grievances to be exploited. Um, how? Um, and, and we'll speak to the scenarios, hopefully at some point, about where this could go. But say, for instance, um, perpetrators would want to use this for political expediency, you know, either in real terms or through creation of, creation of certain perceptions perceptions, including inciting communities that still remain disillusioned, right? Mm. Because they are seeing those who may have stolen their cows on the other side of the fence, uh, continuing to enjoy the benefits of what was part of their livelihood. Or in the case of Jackie and other women who suffered similarly, children who have been stigmatized, who suffer all kinds of socioeconomic harms as a result of the violations that their mothers experienced. Um, and in the absence of state acknowledgement, first and foremost, before we even talk about what reparation, compensation there could be, when we have a space where our state, our people, our citizens, ourselves, have all together um, failed, refused, or neglected to acknowledge that there are those amongst us who suffer this violation, yep. and that that acknowledgement can come with some form of assistance, then we are creating room and allowing that the bitterness, the harm, the negative effects that these victims have suffered can be exploited for further harm 
um, in future uh, periods. So it is a weighty issue. Mm. It has taken 12 long years. And despite the circumstances under which we are having this conversation, I would agree that it is time that we confront it um, and deal with it um, so that we can begin to have some closure. It will be a process, but we must and need to deal with it. Let's take a break at this point. Speaking with uh, Tina Alai, she is a transitional justice lawyer, and uh, Jackie Mutere, she is a victim of a survivor of the post election violence. Um, she underwent a lot and she's told us our story. We're going to have the conversations more and more, 28 minutes after 8, having this conversation on Spice FM on KT and Home and online. Time for a break. We'll be back shortly. Eric Latif, CT Muga Nduoko in the studio. And joining us for this hour is Jackie Mutere, a survivor of the 2007 post-election violence and transitional justice lawyer Tina Lai. Tina, uh, this question is to you. Given the stigma that is attached to rape, how do you overcome this particular hurdle in getting information and data specifically regarding rape and regarding the victims? Thank you, CT. That is an important question indeed. Um, first and foremost is to recognize the barriers that have limited or hindered victims and survivors from coming forward in the way that you know, would be expected or assumed for them to be able to. Um, the first mm -hmm. barrier that they face is the fear of stigma from their families, from their communities, uh, from society at large. And so for victims to come forward, we would expect that the DCI and the state mechanisms would put in place measures where they can come forward and report in a confidential manner for those who would fear um, being associated or linked to these cases. And besides that, that they're actually able to receive some form of psychosocial support, counseling, um, psychological support to help them deal with the trauma that they have experienced as a result of these violations. So first, confidential um, reporting mechanisms, which haven't been the case for ongoing cases, nor for election-related violence cases in 2007, 2008, 2013, and even 2017. Um, the second challenge uh, that we have experienced is where victims are asked themselves to identify the perpetrator who committed the violations against them, and that that is used as the criteria to determine whether or not their cases can move forward. Now, when you're looking at a situation such as the post-election violence, uh, where these uh, incidences occurred in mass scale in hidden spaces by perpetrators, some of whom did not reside in the communities where they committed the crime, we begin to see that it would be very challenging for victims to identify and pinpoint it is perpetrator X, Y, or Z who committed these violations against me. And so, what we have been agitating for and recommending, as established in international law world over, that in instances where conflict-related sexual violence occur, you have several layers of potential accountability. The first is where you're actually able to identify and hold the individual who directly committed the crime accountable. But there's a second layer where you go after those who made those violations possible, who made those attacks possible, either by organizing the gangs or militia or security officers who committed those crimes, or by financing them and therefore facilitating them to be able to commit the crimes. And thirdly, when you're speaking about state security officers, and I speak about this because the evidence available from the Waki Commission report um, and numerous other reports thereafter, provides information that points to the fact that a huge percentage of the crimes that were committed were perpetrated by state security officers themselves. And so when you're talking about state security officers, where victims are unable to identify the actual police or other state security officer who committed the crime, 
we then begin to ask questions of the commanders who were in charge of the battalions that were conducting operations in the areas where the violations occur. And the specific questions we want to know are, was an order given for them to commit this crime? If not, were their commanders aware or ought to have known that such crimes were being committed? And thirdly, even where they were not aware and eventually became aware, did they perform any kind of investigation to confirm those allegations or to take action against officers that were involved? And so moving away from the direct perpetrators will be very critical when it comes to pursuing accountability for SGBV and beginning to look at accountability more broadly to point at um, other layers of responsibility. And finally, on this issue, that even where we're unable to find individual perpetrators for criminal accountability, the other barrier is that state mechanisms have themselves not been held responsible or taken responsibility for what they ought to have done. So for example, there, we are aware that there was, uh, based on the evidence in the Waki Commission report, available intelligence that suggested that there could have been violence in certain parts of the country. And as I speak to this, I think it's important at this point to bring in a constitutional petition mm -hmm. um, that is actually seeking this very state accountability on rape and sexual violence that was committed during the 207 post-election violence. Just to cite the case, it is constitutional petition number 122 that was filed in 2013. It has eight representative victims, six females who were raped, both uh, by state security officers as well as by civilians, militia, across the country, Kibera, Naivasha, um, uh, Kericho, and two male victims who were forcefully circumcised in Naivasha. This case has been in court for the past seven years. Wow. And what is it, it is seeking is this very state accountability. Why? Because victims had failed to find a direct uh, justice for those who directly violated them through the failure to set up the special tribunal. Mm. Um, they had failed to receive reparation. And so they moved to court with the support of four civil society organizations and have been in court. Now, I, I diverted a little to bring that introduction because what this case is seeking is this very state accountability where victims are asserting that the state failed to put in place the necessary measures for example, um, ensuring that the spaces where they lived were secure, mm -hmm. ensuring that communities were sensitized um, about where to report in case violations occurred, mm -hmm. ensuring that victims were able to receive emergency health care. And we all know how vital the first 72 hours is. Many of the victims contracted HIV because they were unable to get PEP on time. Yeah conceived pregnancies because they were unable to get emergency contraceptives and have continued to live with the dire consequences of those violations to date. Tina, Sadly, why, why would this case take so long? I mean, seven years and ongoing. Um, why, why, why is it, is this just a normal course of justice or why is it yeah. taking seven years and what do the vic victims feel about that? It's absolutely not the normal course of justice. And, and if I had the time, um, we would be able to, to list a number of cases that have been initiated and concluded and even gone to appeal within this very same period of seven years. Mm -hmm. As there were numerous factors that have led to the delay, first, um, there was a delay uh, on the part of the state to respond to the petition. Um, so the case was filed in February 2013. And the first response from the Attorney General, who's, who's the first respondent in the case, was received in January 2014. So you can imagine that an entire year was lost waiting to receive a response. Now, thereafter, and there have been many barriers, but I'd just like to highlight the most critical ones in the interest of time. Mm. We have had five different judges in the case. Five. The first judge who listened to the petitioner's case to completion 
and the petitioners called 16 witnesses mm -hmm. was Justice Lenaola. At the time when the matter was concluded and he had finished listening, he then got transferred to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Now, as a result of that transfer, the matter then had to be moved given the different jurisdictions between High Court and the Supreme Court. Justice then no longer handled the matter. Mm -hmm. And we then were moved to another judge. And since then, we have been through four different judges, presently before Justice Career, and we are scheduled to have um, the judgment issued on the 10th of December, which, um, coincidentally, will also be the International Human Rights Day. We hope that finally They'll be right. victims will be able to have their justice. And we hope for a strong judgment um, because we have seen yeah. other judgments that have not necessarily been as encouraging. Um, but we hope that victims can have a strong judgment in this matter. And it's likely to be on a very good day on that day. I mean, if you just think about it, the, the, the day for, for international, the International Day of, day of Justice, mm -hmm. and then this particular ruling comes out, you know, you expect that and you hope that you'll, you're going to get, you know, the, the best judgment and even um, justice for the people who have decided to take this matter to court. Uh, so many years down the road and they're saying look we are seeking justice we want to get justice for 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 this i mean it would it would culminate in a, in a result that you would then say mm. that finally it would be good even if it was one case because then what does that do so then it gives hope it gives hope to all the other people who are who are sitting and waiting and saying perhaps one day would be the day when i would be able to see something like this play out um, as, as these conversations are taking place, I think to myself, if it's taken so long to have this done for so many reasons, you know, five judges on one case, seven years, all of this, it just seems like something that would be so laborious to even get done. And then you ask yourself, if this is what it has taken, and this is one case, and there are thousands that are presented, 1,300 presented, a few of them gone to court, some of them not bothered because they couldn't, they can't imagine going through that entire process. And then here we are making this announcement about the fact that there's a possibility of adding more yeah. into this. If this has not happened in the last 12 years, the possibility of now another 100-odd sum coming into this same pot, what are we talking about here? It's the seriousness of it. And, yeah. and if, if I, and like uh, both of them have said, uh, both Jackie and Tina are saying, if we as a society are not really keen on addressing these issues, then there's something we are saying about ourselves. And it's not just about you know, the government here. So... Those in power will play games with this. They, they'll use it as a political tool, like we're seeing now. It's being used as a political tool. Those in power will play games with it. Um, they, 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 those who will react to it will react to it from a political lens. Those who will be pushing for it will, will be questioning their motive and intention and timing mm -hmm. from a political lens. And yet we forget that the people who are seeking justice, if indeed even one person has gone to the police and said, I have received threats from people who threatened me and even caused me harm 12 years ago. If there's such a case, if something like that has happened, we need to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. We don't need to wait for 100 people. We don't need to... And, and As long as I feel, as, as long as we're pushing it and saying, you know, it's a political timing. I mean, look at the timing of this. I mean, why is Kinoti coming up with this issue now? Now, what is it about 2022? <laughs> it, it, we are weaponizing something we've done to ourselves as a society. What is interesting, if you actually just pause for a second and we remove the drama from the discussion. Mm. Simple fact, 2007 happened. Yep. And the people who suffered as a result of it still live and exist. Those who unfortunately passed away did, but their memories still linger. We can't move away from that. Mm. Now, what you've mentioned, which to me is of note is it tells us a great deal about ourselves and also tells us a great deal about how we like dealing with issues yeah we prefer the ostrich proverbial ostrich and head in the sand approach to matters instead of say look we've time has passed it's gone it hasn't gone it's right there mm. it hasn't moved it actually didn't move mm. and these things People think they don't grow old. They do. Because they form part of a certain culture. Mm -hmm. But then, when you bring in rape into the discussion, 
a lot of the what we're discussing here is rape that men perpetrate against women now it also tells us the attitude that most of our citizens male citizens the attitude we have towards women hmm. because a common thread that also runs in in rape issues has to do with people do not believe you they simply do not believe you yep yes this is something that even the british high commissioner uh, uh jane marriott was saying that one of the biggest problems she had was being believed being believed yes come out and say something and people are like really uh, that's yeah. what happened and the especially problem especially when you're talking about somebody who, uh, who has a position of authority yes <laughs> and chances are you're going to be talking to a majority of people who are male yeah it's the same thing here you're likely to come across policemen who are predominantly male so the moment you get there and if you want to accuse one of them mm. they 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 how far, together just uh, how far do you think that case will go let's bring in Jackie as well because Jackie you, you told us about your story and you told us what happened it was in a neighborhood where you lived with people that you knew um and even since then um, um, uh, i think you even said that you moved from that neighborhood but the people that you knew then the people that you told then the people that you speak to now do you feel like they they look at you and they believe that there is a cause for justice for you Jackie Eric, ask that again. Do they believe? Do I believe that they? Do, do they? <coughs> do they? Do, do they? Does everybody as a society? Uh, you know, you speak about this often. You talk about this in various fora. Mm. Does the society mm. sit back and say, "Yeah, I think we need to do something for Jackie and other victims of the 2007 violence"? Do you know, Eric, that it's one of the it's a taboo subject, mm. and um, I, I have been speaking about this for the past 12 years because now my daughter is 12 years old. And um, it's not easy to manage it at all. And even while people um, sincerely believe that um, uh, just something needs to be done, they don't know what can be done. And especially with sexual violence, the government just really doesn't know how to how to go about it and what 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 they can do and what approach that they can they can take. But as survivors, um, we we have our own concept on what justice is and what people perceive to be justice to them personally. And so we 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 have presented uh, many a time. <clears throat> memorandum and we we even participated in something called the, the after the his excellency um present uh, announced the justice restoration fund mm. we came up um, together with tina and other experts all transitional justice experts and human rights lawyers on what survivors would perceive as justice for them and um uh, we presented we we, we presented the, the the same to them and it has just still been pending up till right now and so even uh, speaking about sexual violence publicly is not an easy thing. I, I guarantee you that. Uh, and um, having people, there are those who, are symp who will sympathize and just sympathize and, and, and it will just end there. But it's difficult for government to manage this. And so we've done many campaigns. The International Day to Right to Truth, which is normally on March 24th. We've presented petition even to, to the Senate. We've pre presented petition to Parliament. Um, uh, asking them to implement the TJRC and specifically also for sexual violence because it's something that is never really talked about. You notice that they, it, it's very easy to talk about IDPs to compensate people who lost land and cows <laughs> and that is the, that the uh, people that had been displaced. But nobody ever thought about what how sexual violence can be compensated. Sure. And in my quest and in my in my quest for justice and in seeking this out, we have have looked have um, approached very diff various um, d different leaders. And they said that, but where were you during that time? We gave them a lot of counseling. Who said that it ended at counseling? And who said that your, perspe your perspective of, of healing is what I should accept as, as, as healing? It, it's very many different things to very many different people. And um, there are those who, for, for your information, um, if Kinoti brought this up again, he would be surprised at the feeling that women have against their perpetrators. Because others were, um, I was violated by Kikuyu. I can tell you I had hang-ups about Kikuyus for a very long time. Mm. There were lawyers who gave birth to Kalenjins. Kalenjins gave birth to Kikuyus. Kikuyus gave birth to Tessels. Tessels gave birth to people from the coast. Mm. People from the coast. I mean, where is the justice in this thing? So the perception of sexual violence is, 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 really, is something that is a bit difficult for them to manage. But it's something that, it's, it's not difficult, it's workable. If you engage any transitional justice process, needs the victims and the survivors themselves to participate in the process because they know when we talk about victims and survivors uh, do we talk yeah. about children do we talk about minors as well because 
You there are also raped. And we talk about boys as well. Absolutely. Anybody who has been violated and has either escaped or died from the violation is a, is a victim or survivor. It has, it has got no age, um, it has got no age, uh, no, no age limitation. If somebody was, um, if somebody sold, the, sold a child, by the way, there are many people who sold children because they were violated and they did not want to have those children from those tribes. They sold those children. That's a victim of the violation. There are others who actually had a, um, uh, forcibly killed their children. I'm, I'm, I'm very well aware of that. Killed their children. They were, they, they, those are, um, those are victims of the of the violation, and there are people even in the informal settlements. It's not necessarily just women alone who are violated. Mm. They were boys, and there were men who were violated. And as even Tina has expressed very clearly, that two of the people, the litigants in, in, in the public in, in interest litigation, are male survivors who were forcibly circumcised, uh, circumcised, and that is sexual violence. There were others who were sodomized. There are people who have been abused physically because they are men, and there were those who were actually abusing because they were children. Mm. Uh, they were abused because they were children. Yes, they were. Uh, and, and so uh, um, justice has got no age limitation. Justice is, is justice, irrespective of age just, um, or, or tribal language. Yeah. So, so Tina, for you, the process, I mean, it seems as if we're almost doing a, a little bit of musical chairs here in terms of what was said and then what was not said, in terms of whether they're going to be opened again, or, or rather fresh investigations are going to start, continuation of what has been going on. There's a lot. Now, what needs to happen? We see examples of countries around the world who have never dealt with injustices and what that has and the toll that it has taken on their current uh, uh, way of doing things or current status. What really yes. needs to happen in Kenya, T uh, Tina? What must happen? How seriously must this be taken if we're really going to deal with yes. the future right? Uh, this must be taken very seriously. As where we began, we are acknowledging that for as long as we do not take it seriously and confront it, it will continue to be with us for years to come. Um, so we must deal with it. Now, there are various measures that have been used across the world um, to deal with this kind of situation. It's complex. It's not only in Kenya where we are struggling with what is the right balance, what is the right approach. But we have strategies and best practices that have been tried around the world. We have tried them ourselves. Where do we go from here? Um, well. On the one hand, we have measures and recommendations that are sitting in our shelves that we can already pick up and start from somewhere. For example, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission report, which was presented to the President in May 2013, there's room for us to implement this report. Why would it be necessary to do so? In Volume 4 of this report, you have a comprehensive framework based on conversations with victims and survivors from across the country on the types of things they would like to see for justice, including healthcare, compensation, education, um, and many forms of, of reform mm. that can address the harms and consequences that they have suffered. So can we implement the TGRC report? Um, secondly, when we're speaking about the criminal accountability route, right now we could consider two possible scenarios and t only time can tell where we're going with it. On the one hand, we don't know, but the reactions that you're hearing suggest that the, there may be mistrust of the genuineness of reopening these cases hmm. uh, because of what victims have experienced. It's been 12 years. And the questions that are being raised is, are, why now? Is there really something afoot? Yeah. What could have really um, instigated, you know, this process? The DCI has explained that there are threats. If we move to the uh, second scenario, moving away from the first, that perhaps there may be political play, if that is the case, then what is the same kind of charade we have been treated to in the past where perhaps this may not result in much, yep. right? Yep. But in the second scenario, which we want to hope is the case, then we have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to meaningfully investigate and bring perpetrators of these heinous crimes that happened during the violence to book. And in doing so, I would then add 
that the DCI and the relevant criminal justice mechanisms must ensure that this is a broad process. Mm. By saying that it's a broad process, we have Jackie, we have other survivors of SGBV from across the country. There will need to be a huge investment to support these survivors to come forward. We have other forms of violations um, from other victims across the country. How do we ensure that this process meaningfully involves a yep. broad range of victims from across the country mm. um, and that we can learn from the mistakes of the manner in which investigations were done in the past, mm. including looking at these crimes in the context of conflict. And I gave an example uh, for sexual and gender-based violence. And finally, where we ought to go. You know, when we talk about transitional justice, we're looking at ways in which we can ensure that these violations do not recur again. Mm. And in doing so, mm. we're trying to ensure that while we put in place reform measures, for example, our 2010 constitution was really in response to the triggers, the causes, how did we get ourselves there? Mm. And that is why we had a raft of all of these reforms, including devolution, electoral reforms, the two-third agenda principles, Indeed. equality funds to deal with marginalization, Indeed. land reforms to deal with historical injustices, and so on. Indeed. A long we conversation, have, this one, uh, Tina, and yes, we, we, we yes. really need to have you know more and more of this going forward and seeking that justice and yes. ensuring that all the victims of uh, yes. post-election violence and other injustices for speaking to us today. Tina Alai is a transitional mm -hmm. justice lawyer and uh, Jackie Mutere is a survivor of the 2007 post-election violence and an advocate for the victims of the 2007 post-election violence to get justice. Asante Nisana for speaking to us and we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Eric. Thank you.